This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Glenn Greenwall, a constitutional lawyer and civil rights lawyer who now is a journalist and blogger at Salon. His new book is Liberty and Justice for Some, How the Law is Used to Destroy Equality and Protect the Powerful. Glenn, welcome to Berkeley. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Where were you born and raised? I was born actually in Queens, but moved almost immediately to South Florida, where I was raised in a suburb for the next 18 years. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Uh, not too much, actually. My, my father was a fairly traditional conservative Republican. He idolized Barry Goldwater and had pictures of Oliver North, John Wayne, and Ronald Reagan in his office adorning the walls. Um, though he wasn't, you know, overwhelmingly ideological, but that was just sort of his general political disposition. And my mother was sort of relatively similar, so I, I, it was really my grandparents who were much more political, um, and my grandfather was on the local city council and sort of waged wars against the powers that be and, and against what he perceived as corruption. I think I was shaped more by them than by my parents. And, and was there uh, a lot of conversation about uh, political affairs at the dinner table at home or at your grandparents? It was more more my, my grandparents. I actually, um, they were very political and I would spend a lot of time there. And my, my grandfather, as I said, ran for city council. And then when I was 18, he had retired from the city council, but he wanted to keep waging these wars and vendettas that he had against various power factions in the city. So he actually encouraged me to run. And I did run for city council when I, city council when I was 18. Um, I came in fourth in a five-way race in the top three won, but I got endorsements from the major newspapers. And um, it was sort of a novelty candidacy at first because I was still in high school, but I was very well versed on the issues from, from his tutelage. Um, and so it got taken seriously, and, and it was an interesting experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, where were you educated? At George Washington University and then NYU School of Law. And, and what yet led you to the law? It was always something that I was fairly predisposed to do. I think there was an expectation that I was going to be a lawyer. There were no lawyers in my family, but I just think um, the skills that I had, the, the talents that people thought I was exhibiting, um, made in their minds law the natural destination for me. And although I resisted that and, and even contemplated studying philosophy and getting a PhD after college, um, ultimately I decided that that was, at least law school was something I wanted to do, and, and so that's the reason I, I went there. And, and in your education, did you have any mentors, or was it really in the stuff that you read in the courses that, that influenced the direction of your career? Yeah, definitely I would say the latter. Um, although, you know, in college I, I was on the debate team um, and, and the intercollegiate debate circuit and devoted the bulk of my time to that. Um, and that developed, I think, a lot of the skills and interest <laughs> that ended up guiding my future career. But I also um, was a philosophy major and read lots of philosophy that definitely impacted my thinking about choice and possibility and lots of other things um, that, you know, even today kind of, I think, help guide the things I, I do and, and what I and choose to do. And did you do uh, much history? Because your, your work seems to be imbued with a, a sense of the historical issues that are tied to the law. History was always a significant interest for me. Um, and I think in order to have the kind of policy debates that I was engaged in as a debater, um, definitely require a fairly broad historical understanding. It just helps perspective, helps advocacy. And so it was definitely a significant interest of mine. But it was really once I began writing about politics, um, and, and I realized how critical it was to have that broader historical understanding so you can have a sense for what really truly is unique and what only seems unique because of how we view things and our biases, uh, did I really start focusing on it in a more thorough way. And uh, you started out after your law degree as a constitutional lawyer uh, and civil rights lawyer. Uh, what explains the transition to journalism and, and being a blogger? 
The idea that I had when I wanted to practice constitutional law was that, for me, political conflicts were not particularly interesting. They didn't seem very consequential. It just seemed like the pendulum swung harmlessly back and forth between Republicans and Democrats, and I thought the differences were quite minor, and I didn't really have an interest in participating in those 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 confrontations. Um, I wanted to. I thought much more important was the framework and the limitations imposed by the Constitution and making sure the government didn't transgress those. But in the wake of 9-11, I started perceiving that I thought there was this extremism and this lawlessness creeping in, and it made defending the Constitution on a case-by-case -case basis inadequate, in, in my view. And I wanted to have a bigger impact on broader political developments and, and the political conversation. I was reading blogs um, and thought they were operating at a fairly high and inspiring level and wanted to be a part of that conversation and just one day spontaneously created a blog without much of a plan. Uh, without really any plan, and and it just sort of through a combination of um, fortuitous circumstances and and other um, attributes, just kind of grew very rapidly and and consumed me and became my new career. Uh, who were your heroes in the law and in journalism uh, uh, that kind of inspired the work you did in in both? I'm not sure I had any specific heroes in law, per se. I mean, I've always been a huge admirer, for example, of the ACLU and knew some ACLU lawyers. Um, I had done a lot of First Amendment work uh, as part of my private law practice, and so interacted with them in that capacity and just generally admired the notion of using law to restrain and restrict uh, those in power on behalf of those who are marginalized. To me, that seemed like the most noble and, 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 and core purpose um, of what the law should and, and could be. In journalism, I read a lot of George Orwell, just as part of philosophy, and his focus on the use of language to deceive and manipulate and propagandize um, was not something that I knew was going to be part of the journalism I was doing and the political writing I was doing until fairly early on when I realized that so much of the discourse is shaped and manipulated by this use of language and kind of returned to Orwell um, in order to better understand the, the political debates on which I was focused. Um, and then maybe a year into what I was doing, I, I began reading I.F. Stone, um, and not reading necessarily his speeches on journalism, but going back and reading his contemporaneous journalism to see how he was reporting and thinking about uh, political issues, what it was that drove him, um, and that certainly had a lot of influence on, on how I try and, and cover the, these issues. I, I always like to ask my guests where, wh the, about the skill set and the, 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 the kind of virtues and, and kind of character that is involved in the work that you do. So let, let me ask you about that. Did, did your law training help you in, in developing the thinking, your thinking and the, and the way you blog? Undoubtedly, I think that one of the obligations, if you're a lawyer and you want to be effective in persuasion, is that you uh, need to think rigorously and, and in a very structured way about the arguments that you're trying to convince others to believe. So that means understanding the logical premises and the foundations of what it is that you're arguing and setting them forth clearly so that everybody can follow along with you on the logical train where you want to take them to the conclusions. And more importantly, it means constantly uh, identifying the evidence on which you're basing these assertions um, so that nobody ever has to take your word for it. They can look at the evidence that you're presenting and have assembled to realize that each step of the way um, the the arguments are, are compelling. And I think putting things together in this very structured way and being very transparent and, and sort of abundant about citing evidence is something that is infrequently done in political argument and in journalism. And I think that's one big reason why my writing was able to have an impact. Mm -hmm. And and uh, the the issue of, of of citation on on the web is, is really quite something because you can link to the to the actual evidence you're describing. I know that in reading your blog, you're often you know citing uh, uh, cases and sending us directly to the affidavits that have been, that have been filed. Right. Well, one of the the one of the experiences that I had <coughs> early on is when I started writing about politics, I. <clears throat> excuse me, um, was was basically what I had thought was a, a high-end consumer of political news. So I thought I was fairly well informed because I was reading the New York Times every day and the Atlantic and the New Yorker and all the media journals and, and organs that people who believe they're they're sophisticated consumers of news are 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 are, are reading. 
And one of the luxuries that writing about politics full time affords is that you don't have to rely on the mediation of other people. Um, you can go and look at original documents and source citations and speak to newsmakers and interview them and really look at the events and the evidence firsthand without anyone having to stand in the way between them and, and that and you. And when I did that, I, I really understood and I realized that so much of what I had thought I knew was in fact myth and it was um, false and just sort of on this baseless edifice. And so the benefit to me of being able to go and look at material firsthand and make those assessments on my own was incredibly valuable. And I wouldn't want a readership that just trusts my assessments and believes in the things I'm saying because I'm saying it. I want to make sure that um, they can engage in that same exercise to the extent that time permits and, and they have the willingness. And the thing about the internet is it not only allows that with such incredible ease where everything is on the internet and you're one click away from reading it instead of having to go down to the library and look at microfiche or find the documents in some other way, um, but also the, it eliminates space constraints. So the New York Times and the print edition has to convey all the information information it has to convey in a 800 words or 1200 words, um, whereas on the internet the space is, is limitless and space and, and links make it so that you can present the reader with all the information in the world that they could possibly want and you leave it up to them what it is that they want to uh, examine. And, and you, are, you, you are one of the best at both update and feedback uh, so that in the, in, you present uh, an essay and then but then in the course of the day several updates yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting. One of the the defining attributes of traditional journalism that I think has been very debilitating is that it was always a one-way conversation. So if you were a columnist for a major newspaper or a reporter on a television station and you said something lazy or wrong or uh, deceitful or biased, it was very difficult for you to get any feedback. I mean, basically, people would have the option to write a letter to the editor that all major media figures basically disregarded. They didn't care what their readers were saying, but otherwise they were insulated and they kind of reinforced each other's conventional wisdom because they were only hearing and speaking to each other. What the internet has done is made everything extremely interactive. So the minute that I write something, within 10 minutes, there'll be 15 people who have given me their reaction. Um, if there are errors logically or factually, I hear about it in every single conceivable way by email, by comment section. Um, and and Beyond that, the positive side is that oftentimes people who are responding to the things that I've written um, are adding something extremely important that I've overlooked or pointing out a fact of which I was unaware or pointing to a piece of evidence that bolsters things. If someone objects to what I've written, I can respond immediately. And this interactive process fortifies the quality of everything that's written. And if you're you know, a responsible and smart journalist, you're looking at that feedback not as a nuisance or as harassment or as whatever other ways that lots of traditional journalists see it, but as an invaluable resource. Um, and, you know, interacting in that way has always been the thing that I've liked best about writing about politics on the internet. Talk a little about this quality of character, the, the virtues that are required to do what you do, because my, my take on you is that it, it, it really takes courage to do what you're doing. You know, I think that one, one of the things that interests me about the history of journalism is how much the journalist has changed, the role of the journalist has played has changed. So, if you look back four or five decades ago, if you were somebody who went into journalism, it was basically more or less guaranteed that you were going to be relatively poor. You weren't going to be rich going into journalism. The iconic journalist was somebody who was sitting in this newsroom kind of slovenly dressed with all sorts of ink stains on their hands. Um, and they tended to be people who were really attracted to that field because they wanted to subvert power. They wanted to work against authority and be a check on it, expose their improprieties. Um, the, the motto of afflict the powerful and, and comfort the powerless was sort of the driving ethos. Um, and, and, and what has happened over the past four or five decades is that, that media outlets have become purchased by large corporate conglomerates. So now if you're a media figure um, in, in one of these uh, establishment venues, you're basically nothing more than a very highly paid employee of a major corporation. And those people tend to be, people who thrive in, in major corporations tend to be people who learn how to and are comfortable accommodating power rather than subverting it and giving their environment and the people who control it what it is they want instead of cutting against the grain and being provocative and, and subverting it. Um, and I see independent journalism um, as sort of a rejuvenation of this idea that journalism and, and commentary are going to be this insurgent force. 
um, which are really there to work against and, and to check those in power. And, and I think, you know, it's, a lot of it is just your disposition and personality. Um, and, you know, the law that I did and everything that I've done in my career has been about um, sort of equalizing the playing field by representing the marginalized and the powerless against people who are powerful. It's what I like doing. It's what I derive satisfaction from and think is somewhat noble. And so that's the kind of journalism I, the only kind of journalism I want to do. Before we talk about your uh, book, uh, I want to talk a little about your assumptions. And really, you're, you, you are dealing with the dynamic or the relationship between power, the legal system, and principle. Uh, talk a little about the, the ideal relationships there and, and what your work is about in relation to those three things. There's, there's one of the fascinating things to me about the American founders um, and for all their flaws and all their deficiencies and, and bad acts is that they were, in my view, both incredibly thoughtful um, and incredibly prescient. Uh, and you know, they were very learned and, and steeped in philosophy and political theory and um, conceptions of justice. And one of the things that almost all of them emphasized, in fact, I would almost describe it as a consensus among them, uh, was that multiple forms of outcome inequality were going to be justifiable. And not just justifiable, but inevitable and desirable. Um, so some people are going to be very rich, and most people are going to be very poor. And some people are going to be very powerful, and most would be powerless, some very accomplished, most ordinary. And they were happy with that. They were, they, they were fine with that. They even wanted to build a system that would foster that, provided that there was some anchor of legitimacy to those outcome inequalities. Um, and what they argued, uh, and it's sort of seeped into in, in the Enlightenment, um, is that these outcome inequalities would be justifiable and legitimized only if there was a common set of rules to which everyone was equally bound. Um, and that, that meant not just the most powerless, but the most powerful. In fact, they needed that constraint more than anybody else because they were the ones wielding the greatest power. Um, and this is what law was designed to do, what the rule of law was intended to accomplish, was to uh, prevent massive corruption and abuse of power by applying rules and constraints to those who wield it the most. And this is, I think, the, the central requirement of a just society, is that the more power you have, the more transparency, the more checks and, and, and safeguards um, are applied to you. And I think that is really the ultimate intent of the law. And so when I see abandonment of that principle, when I see the opposite ethos setting in, that the more powerful you are, the more free of constraint you should be, um, the more dangerous I think that is. And, and so that's why I think it's so important to apply this adversarial force to anyone who exercises power, whether you think they're magnanimous or malignant, um, on the right side or the wrong side, because inevitably that power will be abused if it's not um, safeguarded with all kinds of constraints. And, and the, the, the end product of your book is really to say that uh, we, we've lost a lot of that. I think we're, we're in danger of losing almost all of it. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of complicated reasons, but one reason is that, you know, the idea has always been that this great financial and, and, and income and wealth inequality would coexist with equality in the context of political and legal institutions. And we've certainly been on the path where political, uh, where financial and, 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 and wealth inequality are no longer consistent with political and legal equality because that financial wealth is used to co-op political and legal institutions. And that co-option process has meant that no longer do political and legal authorities exercise power over financial elites. It's the reverse uh, relationship. Um, and, you know, while there's lots of imperfections in American history, you can see that that has basically not been true throughout our history. I mean, Teddy Roosevelt, when he was in office, purposely targeted the two most powerful corporations at the time, Standard Oil and J.P. Morgan, and broke them up into little pieces. Franklin Roosevelt brought in a whole series of redistributive policies that provoked the hatred and anger of, of tycoons and Wall Street executives that he said he was wearing as a badge of honor. Inconceivable today where we have what is essentially, and you find this in mainstream sources being said all the time remarkably about America, really an oligarchy. Um, there's this article in, in The Atlantic from May of 2009 written by Simon Johnson who 
who was the former chief economist of the International Monetary Fund, as mainstream and establishment a position as it can get, and it was called the quiet coup. And that word coup in the title refers to the fact that um, essentially oligarchy has replaced American democracy, and he describes how he worked at the IMF with all kinds of emerging market tyrannies and studied and, under, and, and ma helped manage how they responded to financial crises and other political crises, and that the essence of this tyranny, of this lawlessness, was that financial elites could co-opt the political process and force the political institutions and authorities to respond in a way to protect their interests at the expense of everyone else's. And that's obviously what happened in America with the financial crisis, and I think it highlighted um, just how extreme this, this corruption ha ha has become. So, so what you're saying is that a, a legal system built on the principle of equality before the law has morphed into a system that defends privilege, basically, uh, and thereby has, has corrupted the whole notion of what the law should be. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to understand this distinction, which is, I mean, of course it's always been the case in throughout American history that if you are wealthy and powerful that you have advantages within the legal system. That's just clearly true. And it's also true that there are all kinds of radical and violent breaches in American history of the Slavery. principle of equality yeah. before the yeah. law. For example, um, you know, American history is, is basically grounded in a violation of the principle of equality under the law. But the difference between then and now, to me, is that even when the founders and others who succeeded them were violating the principle of equality before the law, they were radically, they were enthusiastically and vocally affirming its validity and its the importance of its supremacy. Now you can say that there's an that 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 that, that that's basically the the defining attribute of hypocrisy, espousing principles that you violate in 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 your actions, and that's true. But there's another side, a more positive side to espousing principles that you nonetheless fail to comport to, which is that you enshrine the principle as the aspiration, as the animating principle by which you understand progress and move toward perfecting the union. So because this idea of supremacy, the supremacy of the rule of law was maintained even when it was violated, it's what led to the next two centuries of American progress, of the emancipation of slaves, the elimination of Jim Crow, the franchisement of women, the, the superior treatment of Native Americans, the better um, circumstances for gay Americans, and a whole litany of others was, was driven by this principle. And what has really happened over the past three or four decades, and I trace it back to the Ford pardon of Nixon, is that we now no longer just violate this principle, we expressly and explicitly repudiate it. We've renounced it. We have a whole series of arguments that are commonly aired in the elite opinion-making circles of our country that are designed to justify why the most powerful people, by virtue of their power, should be shielded from the rule of law when they commit crimes rather than subjected to it on equal terms. And that, to me, is the really radical uh, change that distinguishes it from the first couple centuries. Now, now the, the Founding Fathers also designed a system of government, the three branches which were to, to help uh, sort of implement the aspirational goals of the law. So a system was put in place, a set of principles that would move forward even though they recognized the inequalities that existed in their time. Well, I mean, that, you know, every society evolves. No society is completely stagnant. And so the question becomes, in which direction will it evolve? And the principles that we affirm matter even if we're failing to comply with them because that will determine the direction in which we move. So if you look at all those instances of social progress that I, I, I alluded to, you will find in the debates that were that preceded them and that led to them, that progress, the advocates of the progress citing these principles, invoking them. These are principles that as Americans we are inculcated with and therefore reflexively understand. I mean, you know, we learn them through cliches, you know, bl justice is blind and equality before the law and a nation of law and not men. These are things that all of us as Americans in terms of how we learn our political values uh, by osmosis um, sort of ingest. And that's vitally important for determining the direction of the country. So when you start explicitly renouncing these principles, the way that Gerald Ford did, for example, when he went on television and said, in order to justify to a very skeptical and angry nation why Richard Nixon would be insulated from all consequences for his felonies. And he said, look, of course I believe in the rule of law, the idea that law is no respecter of persons. That's the crux of this principle. 
Uh, but the, he then went on to add this sort of newly concocted amendment designed, designed to gut the principle that he had just invoked. And he had said, but law is a respecter of reality, meaning that if holding the politically powerful to accountability under the law when they commit crimes is too divisive or too disruptive in the eyes of the political leaders, then it is justifiable to suspend the rule of law and to exempt political elites from its dictates and mandates. And that's another way of saying that we've renounced the rule of law, that we've become a nation of men. And, and really, by, by, by implanting that, that, that justifying framework, um, it ensured the several next, next several decades of, of elite immunity that we're seeing. And so in, in pardoning Nixon for his crimes as president, uh, uh, the President Ford was, in essence, saying he's too important to have accountability. And, and you see that as, as a kind of a defining moment. Now, I, I'm curious about something, namely, if, if, in terms of structural analysis, what, what are the factors here at work? Is it, is it, does this really start with the national security state and the buildup of that state you know, at the end of World War II and throughout the Cold War? There's, that certainly plays a very significant role, and the reason why it does is probably best expressed by Dwight Eisenhower in his 1961 farewell address when he warned that this apparatus was becoming this sprawling, secret uh, center of power beyond the reach of democratic accountability, more powerful even than the highest elected officials such as himself. He had obviously spent a great deal of his two terms battling against it, often unsuccessfully, and understood its growing power. And we basically ignored those warnings. And so what we really have in place, um, and, and again, this used to be the province of dissidents and radicals to point out, but is now in the most mainstream sources. So in the Washington Post last year, there was a three-part series by Dana Priest, the Pulitzer Prize winner, and, and William Arkin, entitled Top Secret America, that essentially described what Dwight Eisenhower five decades ago called the military-industrial complex that the Washington Post said was this kind of shadow government that is so secretive and so powerful that not even the officials who are charged with managing it understand what it is or what it does or how, um, how enormous it has become. And by basically creating a shadow government that exists beyond the reach of democratic accountability, that engages in conduct which routinely, reflexively, um, is not even known to the population, um, let alone subjected to any kind of rigorous scrutiny, we've essentially endorsed the idea that those in power can act without checks, um, without any transparency, without dem democratic accountability. Um, and I think you're absolutely right that that has played a major role in this mindset um, that we expect that of, of our leaders, not just tolerate it, but expect it. So, so in the national security area, the, the pardon of, uh, of Nixon uh, is followed by the pardon of the Iran-Contra uh, government officials, is followed by the, uh, the pardon of Schoonger Libby and the non-accountability of the whole top tier of the Bush administration for really engaging in torture. So there's a clear line here where each uh, pardon uh, uh, in essence, legitimates the following pardons. Precisely, and it, and it crept out further and further. So you can look at what many, how many people saw the Nixon cover-up as being clear crimes but not particularly threatening because it was really about a cover-up and misleading political institutions. And you then move to the Iran-Contra um, scandal, which was clearly more serious than Watergate in that there was literally a congressional prohibition in place designed to do nothing but bar the use of funds to overthrow the Nicaraguan government by supporting what was a terrorist organization, um, in, 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 in the Contras, and, and yet they deliberately violated that and then lied to federal investigators, the grand jury, and Congress as well, a, a more coordinated, um, pervasive, systemic um, breach of the law. Uh, that was quite deliberate and, and quite threatening to the democracy, and yet that, that got immunized. And so then you move into the Bush years, where you're talking about the most serious crimes political leaders can can commit. I mean, what's amazing to me, for example, um, is that if you look at what was said at, at, at the Nuremberg tribunals after World War II, the lead prosecutor of the tribunal, Robert Jackson, the former attorney general under President Truman, stood up and said, um, 
the kingpin crime that the Nazis have engaged in is not genocide or the erection of concentration camps or the expulsion of large ethnic populations from particular areas. The kingpin crime, the crime that ties it all together, is the crime of aggressive war because that's what enables all the other inhumane acts that take place, makes them inevitable, and that the Nuremberg Tribunal would have validity only if these principles were applied not only to the defendants but also to all nations here assembled, meaning the United States and its allies. And yet the idea of punishing uh, political leaders for the aggressive attack on Iraq that killed over 100,000 human beings at least and displaced millions more um, is something that isn't even ever entertained in mainstream discourse. If you say it, you'll be, it's basically a self-marginalizing act. Um, the creation of a worldwide torture regime, torture was really the single moral and ethical taboo in Western culture for, for centuries. Um, and so you're talking about crimes spying on American people systematically without warrants required by the criminal law um, that are really at the heart of abuse of power and that have destroyed um, enormous numbers of lives, far more than the crimes for which we punish millions of Americans. And so the fact that we now apply this rationale to even crimes that egregious and that destructive shows how entrenched and normalized that mindset has become. You, uh, in your book, which I, I don't think we can do justice to in, in this interview, but I want to try to raise some of the salient points, you really look at the mechanisms that maintain the system once it's there. And, 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 and it, in doing that, it allows you to look across different domains. So you can talk about national security, but you can also talk about the banks. And here, what you point out is the, the loosening of the boundaries between the private and the public. And so people move from government to the private sector and can establish rules in government while they're there that uh, benefit the private sector, which they then go uh, to serve. So in your book, uh, Robert Rubin sits next to uh, the former CIA director, McConnell. Absolutely. I mean, w w there's lots of different ways that this public and private division have eroded. One way is the revolving door that you just described that's fairly well known to most people who are observers of the political scene, which is um, there's someone who serves industry and who works in industry and is enriched by it. They then go to work in the exact government position that oversees and regulates that industry, and they then take action to benefit the industry which they were previously working in and, and profiting from. And then when they're done presenting that industry with all sorts of gifts as a public figure, as a political figure, they go back to that industry and get rewarded. Um, so Mitch M Michael McConnell, for example, the, the uh, admiral who served as Bush's national intelligence director, for me is the prime example because he was at Booz Allen um, after his military career. And at Booz Allen, he was the representative of the telecom industry and the national co defense contracting industry. And what he advocated there was a greater merger of public and private functions so that he wanted to have many more government functions in the national security realm privatized and outsourced to this industry that he represented and from which he profited um, because there are greater profits that way. And he advocated this aggressively. He was the chairman of the association designed to achieve this. And then once he became the director of national intelligence and returned to government, he just continued doing exactly what he was doing in the private sector. His agenda was precisely identical. So he would privatize aggressively homeland security functions and, and national security state functions and outsource them even further to the industry that he had served. He was the leading advocate of telecom immunity, of immunizing the telecom industry from the lawsuits that were brought for their participation in the illegal eavesdropping program. In other words, using his position as national secure, as national as an intelligence director to demand this full-scale immunity for the industry that he served. And then once the Bush administration was over, he ran back to the loving arms of, of Booz Allen um, and basically reaped all the profits and rewards um, for his work in the public sector on its behalf. Um, but even more so, there's a complete erosion in terms of functionality. So that if you look at a lot of the documents that were exposed as part of the national, uh, the NSA warrantless eavesdropping scandal, what you see is that there is a, a virtual conglomeration, an aggregation between uh, national security agencies and government and private telecommunication and, and contracting companies so that there really is no line anymore. They're basically nothing more than just different divisions of the same entity. And what was amazing to me is that when um, Admiral McConnell was appointed the director of national intelligence, he was at Booz Allen before that for 10 years, and he went to the Senate 
And the senators asked him, well, are you really up to date on um, what is taking place inside the government and the latest um, and most recent um, policies and challenges that the national security state faces, given that you've been in the private sector for 10 years? And he said, look, I've been working on exactly what I'm going to be working on in this new position. It's, it's as though I never left. That was a direct quote. And he didn't leave. He, at Booz Allen, he was working for the same entity and the, for the same policies towards the same end that the Department of Homeland Security and the CIA and the Pentagon um, all implement as well. And this is why this immunity that Gerald Ford bestowed upon Richard Nixon that was then given to Iran-Contra uh, officials has now been vested in private sector elites as well because they're essentially part of the same project. And now the other failure here that is quite shocking when you look at the, the, the history here is the extent to which both Democratic presidents, Clinton and, and uh, Obama, have adopted the notion of let's look forward and not backward. So uh, although they run on the premise, not just in Obama's case of hope, but of, of bringing to account these people, when they come in, nothing happens. Right. It's, it's really, it, there's a fascinating article in December of 2008, uh, three or four weeks after President Obama had won the election, but prior to his inauguration. And it talked about what was this newly revealed reluctance, as the Times called it, that Obama was expressing as clearly as he could to investigate the crimes of the Bush era, torture, warrantless eavesdropping, um, obstruction of justice, and, and, and attacks on Iraq, the attack on Iraq. And what was so striking about it was that during the campaign, he was often asked whether or not he would sanction those kinds of investigations. And his answer was always the same, which was, look, the rule of law is the rule of law, and anyone who violates the law has to be subjected to meaningful investigations. And I'm going to direct my attorney general to investigate whether or not crimes were committed. And if they were, then the people who are responsible have to pay the price just like ordinary citizens do. That was his stock answer. And yet before he was even inaugurated, he had made clear that he had no intention of fulfilling that promise, that he had already decided that he opposed not just criminal investigations, but congressional investigations by the Democrats who controlled Congress. Um, and even early on in the administration, it was revealed by WikiLeaks diplomatic cables that the Obama administration had been using diplomatic power to prevent other countries even, like Spain and Germany, whose citizens had been tortured from investigating. And what this Times article said was that the reason why presidents who get into power are so incentivized to block investigations of their predecessor is because there's basically this ongoing gentleman's agreement across time where presidents know that they protect their predecessors from investigations and accountability, and they therefore will not be subjected to investigations or accountability by the other party once they leave office. It's a law-breaking license, an elite license to break the law, um, that it's in everyone's interest who is a member of that class to maintain and preserve. And and it's why presidents preserve it. It's why media figures who are part of this elite class advocate for it and defend it. Um, and it's why private sector elites are, are so eager to justify it and then receive its, its benefits as well. It's really a class-based phenomenon that everyone who's in this circle can avail themselves of. And that's why they, they defend it. You, you point out that the, the exception here was the uh, conviction of Scooter Libby. And, and what you point out is that really he had, in, in committing a crime, he had done something against the CIA officer. Right. So there was an ability to balance power in this particular case. Bush, of course, uh, pardoned him in, in the end. Uh, uh, so he did not serve jail time. So, so what yeah, he you, commuted the sentence. He commuted the sentence, yeah. So, so yeah, he didn't pardon him, right. but he commuted the sentence. So, so the question then is, what we're really looking at here is a failure of power to balance power, that the, the system has run away from our principles and our legal system uh, because they, we're not creating the political movements to, to change things. It, it, let's talk a little about that because we, we have, in the case of Obama, somebody who put on the table change and the possibility of hope uh, uh, some sort of coalition was built that elected him, uh, and then it was dissipated when he came into office. 
one of the realities of political life for people who get to Washington, and you see this all the time with very well-intentioned people who actually run for political office for the right reasons and believe that they'll get to Washington and, 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 and adhere to their values and serve the interests of, of their, their constituents and the like, is that these are very powerful systemic forces. So, for example, you know, Elizabeth Warren has been a very popular and outspoken and impassioned um, advocate on behalf of populist causes, running against Wall Street, uh, condemning both parties for being captive to those interests. And now she's running for Senate in, in Massachusetts, and a lot of people are very excited by this fact. And I'm not one of them because I know that once she gets to Washington, there are going to be extraordinary pressures brought to bear on her um, that aren't just about bullying and pressuring, um, but are just about incentive. So if she gets to Washington and she wants to be on the committees where she can be effective, um, she's going to need to have good relationships with the leadership of her party. If she wants legislation to be brought to the fore, she can't alienate uh, fellow senators or the White House. Um, if she wants to build coalitions and stay in power, she's going to need to raise lots of money and can't have Wall Street massively funding her opponent. And uh, time and again, we see that well-intentioned people who have the right values get to Washington inside the system and get impeded by it or converted by it. It's a slow and gradual process, but inexorable and powerful. Um, and I think that this is one of the reasons, you know, we're sitting in Berkeley just 10 minutes away from Oakland, um, and I just actually came from the Occupy Oakland encampment. Um, and have visited many of these sites around the country as I'm doing my book tour. And one of the things that I think is incredibly clear about this movement, there are some things that are unclear and still to be determined, but one of the things that's so clear is that the, what binds these protesters is the sense that effectuating meaningful change through our political and legal institutions is no longer possible because it isn't about specific leaders so that if you work against Obama and replace him with some other president, things are going to change. It's the idea that these institutions are so radically and fundamentally corrupted that the only way to effectuate change is to work outside of them, for citizens to band together and kind of put this pressure on power factions, put a little bit of fear in their hearts, make it clear that citizens have power as well and that can check those in power. Um, and that's why I find that movement inspiring um, and exciting and I think filled with such promise because it can alter that, that dynamic that you just described. You, there was a sentence in your book that really stood out. You said, public rage today has no mechani mechanism to produce consequences. So, so, what, so what's the fix here? In other words, let, let's say that uh, the the ninety nine percent movement becomes a real political movement. How will it manifest itself? Well, I think it's a bit hard to say because it's so incipient and and and, and it's very organic. So it it basically the the movement is not coordinated. There's no top down directive. There's no overarching. Um, concise theme. There's no legislative demands. It basically is nothing more from day to day other than what the people who participate in it make it out to be. Um, but that said, I think that one of the models that has inspired it, whether consciously or not, is the movement in, in the Arab world as part of the Arab Spring. The idea that citizens of those countries who are infinitely more deprived than most of the people participating in the American protest movement are, and who have been kept materially deprived for decades, and who face far more entrenched tyrannies than the more vulnerable and diffuse political institutions and authorities that the United States has, um, that they were able to disrupt the status quo and threaten the power factions running their countries to that extent, and some things have changed, some things haven't, um, meant that I think to a lot of people that, well, we in the United States with our resources and opportunities and, um, and, 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 and money and, and, and means of communicating certainly um, can do that. And, and I think what the Arab Spring taught is that citizens simply banding together to express dissent to the political system and anger and a refusal to tolerate the status quo any longer is itself an incredibly powerful force if for no other reason that what happens when power factions are challenged is the first thing they do is apply force to try and crush them. And when that doesn't work or they're too constrained, they start to try to placate the citizen anger because they're afraid of it. They're afraid that it will threaten their prerogatives or undermine the, the system that, that empowers them. Um, and I think that's the process that we're going to start to see is that the political class will feel compelled 
and the financial class will feel compelled to start to think about how to address these problems. That's why you already see for the first time in, in forever um, the, the dangers and injustice of massive income inequality and wealth inequality making their way into establishment media discourse. This movement has accomplished that already because it can no longer be hidden. And I think you're going to start to see efforts to try and accommodate those concerns or at least create the appearance that they're being accommodated um, in order to, to, to diffuse the movement. Uh, in your book, you point out that, uh, and we're running out of time here, but, but you do point out about what happens to the unequal part of the system and how the law is turned against them. And you point out, and it's very interesting, that the, uh, the, the Nixonian uh, call for law and order morphs into the war on drugs, which then morphs into the war on terror. And in, in all three cases, there seems to be a political consensus, which people like Clinton uh, embrace, even though they're originally defined uh, by uh, uh, the Republicans. So, so in, in the end, we, we have to turn this political equation to, to, to make a difference. Now, this leads me, we have to talk about your views of the media. And you, you've already told us here that your background is having read a lot of Orwell, right. uh, who was an influencer. So, so words and information become extremely important uh, in addition to what's happening on the street in, in sort of mobilizing a sense of history and of what the reality is, what, what's happening uh, and, and what has to be changed. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, all these things are so tied together. Um, and, you know, one of my kind of formative experiences, um, as I described earlier, was was recognizing that all the things that I had thought I knew about political reality was in reality actually false, that it was sort of the byproduct of this edifice of propaganda. And so much of that comes from the words that we constantly hear that we just simply accept in terms of what they're supposed to signify. Um, and the discourse that that is propagated about political realities and, and, and arguments and the like um, plays an incredibly important role in all of this. And so I had, when I first began writing about politics, no intention whatsoever about even thinking about media issues or issues of media criticism because it didn't interest me. Um, I thought it was just kind of vapid um, discourse, and it is all that, but it, it, it plays such a central role that if you want to have a meaningful outcome, impact on political outcomes and on how political debates are resolved, you need to engage these questions of how political debates are conducted, what views are permitted and what views aren't permitted, the, un, the embedded, unexamined assumptions that underlie so much of what we talk about and how we talk about it in order to kind of strip it down to its barest essence. Um, and so I try and devote a lot of my energies to that endeavor because I think that's one of the key truth finding um, uh, uh, tactics to be able to, to show people um, the difference between what they've been told is real and what is in fact real. And, and in, in you, I, I believe liberty, yeah, liberty is in, in the title of your book, and, and you have in your blog uh, uh, two cases that I can think of focused on the rights of an individual, uh, uh, Manning, the, the WikiLeaks, uh, the alleged leaker to WikiLeaks right. on the one hand, and then the uh, assassination by uh, presidential decree of al -Waki. So here you have something that's done to an individual that you have to build moral outrage about what was done, because in both cases, a line is crossed. Talk a little about that, because th this is really where the power of words is really important. Well, absolutely. I mean, one of one of the things that fascinates me about um, our political dialogue is that there's this there's this common paradox, which is that the words that are most frequently used and that have the greatest impact are often the words that are the most ill-defined and therefore subject to manipulation, deceit, and propaganda. So, the word terrorist, for example, is something that pervades countless political 
discussions of signif great significance. And we're essentially at the point, literally, where if the government points to somebody and simply utters the word terrorist, large numbers of citizens, it used to just be Republicans, but now under President Obama, it's Democrats as well, will cheer for whatever it is that is done to them, no matter how lawless, no matter how much... Um, uh, how little evidence has been presented to justify it. The mere fact that they've been labeled a terrorist is something that will basically cause a majority of people to sanction whatever is done. And yet what's so fascinating about the word terrorist is it really is a term that has absolutely no fixed meaning. It is simply uh, a term that is we, means whatever the person wielding it wants it to mean. Um, originally there was a sense that it meant um, indiscriminate deliberate attacks on civilians for political ends and yet we see all the time that if a Muslim attacks a military base in Fort Hood um, and kills soldiers who are being deployed to a war, he's called a terrorist. If a civilian in a particular country that the United States invades AIDS, um, engages in violence against the invading occupying army, he too is called a terrorist. Um, and yet when the United States or its allies engages in violence, clearly aimed at civilians, deliberately or recklessly, um, you can never call that terrorism. And so terrorism has basically become nothing more than Muslims who engage in violence against the United States or who otherwise impede the will of the United States. And so what's amazing to me is you can talk to a whole bunch of people who are otherwise sympathetic to civil liberties, concerns, and the like. I, I was on um, a, a San Francisco radio station today um, with what is, I guess, known as a liberal uh, public station. Uh, Michael Kresny, I think, is the radio host. And he was saying, essentially, that he was thrilled when Anwar al waki was killed, even though it was done without due process, because he said, I know he's a terrorist. Um, and the reality is, is that he has no idea whether or not Anwar al waki is a terrorist, because he has no idea what the term even means, and he has no idea whether or not um, he actually involved, was ever involved in violent attacks against the United States, because no evidence has ever been presented. What people really know is that Anwar al waki is somebody who advocated views that are antithetical to, adverse to the United States. The idea that the United States is bringing huge amounts of violence to the Muslim world and therefore it's not just the right but the duty of Muslims to attack back as a means of defense and deterrence. Um, and yet that is not terrorism, that's pure First Amendment free speech expression. Um, but because the word terrorism is so potent and shuts down all debate, the mere application of that label by the government anonymously and with no evidence to this individual has made huge numbers of people stand up and cheer the most radical power a government can seize, which is the power to target uh, one's own citizens for death, for assassination, in total secrecy, and with no due process. And that, to me, really illustrates the, the potency of, of how these propagandistic terms are, are wielded. And, and in all of these cases that you're talking about, what you have is the violation of a principle, a kind of a, a, a line in the ground that we're not supposed to cross. And over time, I guess the sand or something is covering it, so it becomes easier for the authorities to do this. So you use the example of the, the invocation of national security and secrecy, which started as an evidentiary issue, where we can't introduce this particular piece of evidence in this proceeding against this person, has now become, well, we can't even go to trial about this. Right, you can't even entertain the, the legal case, and that's why not a single war on terror victim people who were tortured or detained, even though we know we're innocent, have even had their claims heard in the court. Um, instead, their courthouse doors have been slammed in their face based on this wildly distorted and expanded notion of secrecy. And to me, this is one of the key issues because as somebody who works on civil liberties and, and used to litigate First Amendment cases, um, I used to represent some people with truly repellent views, neo-Nazis and white supremacists and others, whose free speech rights were being assaulted. And of course, a lot of times when you do that, people will ask you, well, why would you want to represent somebody like that? Their views are incredibly toxic. They probably inspire violence. And the answer, which I think is obvious, if you look at political history, even for a short period of time, is that the way that rights erosions work is that they're always applied in the original instance to some unsympathetic figure. So if the government wants to seize the power to kill people, they'll pick Anwar al waki who is easily demonizable. If the government wants to justify immunity for elites, they'll say, let's do it in the case of Richard Nixon, where everybody is sick of Watergate and wants to move on. And what happens is when you endorse the principles in the first instance, the principle itself, not just the application that you like, becomes entrenched. It becomes 
becomes legitimized and, and, and institutionalized. And the guarantee is that once the government is vested with that particular power in that particular case, it will expand beyond the scope which it's originally represented to, to, to exist in. And that's the reason why it's so crucial to argue against it and defend against it and, and, ref and object to it in the first instance, even when, uh, for whatever reasons, you may like the particular outcome of, of its application. And secrecy is, is a perfect example where it was very narrowly constrained and justified um, in the wake of the need to confront the Soviet Union and now has become simply the way of life of our government, that we have a secret government that basically operates exclusively in the dark. Uh I'm curious, what keeps you going? And, and uh, this is why I'll tell you why I'm asking you this, because there, there might be students out there who watch this program who, who, who want to know how to, they should prepare the, for the future. So, so what, what is the answer here in uh, preparing for the future and confronting the issues that, that you're grappling with? I mean, I think that you have to begin with a sense of optimism, that you believe from history that even the most powerful uh, human structures are subject to being meaningfully challenged and, and altered and even torn down and replaced. And to me, that is a, an inviolable and indisputable lesson of history, that even the most seemingly entrenched powers um, can be undermined and weakened and uh, replaced by other human beings. And if it's not happening, it's just because, it's not because it's impossible, it's because we just haven't figured out the right way to do it. And so the challenge of figuring out the right way to do that and the role that I can play in it and, and the way in which I can use my skills and, and my knowledge and my experience in order to help contribute to it um, is a really important and invigorating challenge for me. It becomes an, a work of passion and a sort of labor of love. Um, and everybody has you know, particular talents. Um, people who go to, are, are fortunate enough to go to, to to universities and, and, and postgraduate schools um, have a choice about whether or not they what they want to do with those skills and, and those, those, those weapons that they've developed for themselves. Um, and I think it's vitally important to figure out what it is that you ultimately think is important, what it is that you want to devote your life to and, and the outcomes that you want to help achieve and then sort of with a single-minded uh, devotion apply yourself to it. But the, the, the prerequisite is to understand um, that defeatism and resignation are really kind of irrational um, because it's premised on this false notion um, that, that certain power factions are too strong and too invulnerable to be challenged. And I think history, even recent history, proves pretty clearly that that isn't the case. Well, on that note, uh, Glenn, I want to show your book uh, one more time and, and really uh, recommend it uh, to our audience. We had only an hour to just touch some of the high points, but it's a great read. And so thank you very much for uh, taking the time to being on our program. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. Thank you.